So the, the Coast Salish peoples. Uh, you, I know, are f- from other places around the province. Um, we acknowledge the stewardship of those traditional peoples and of those territories and look forward to working together with them productively in the future. I'll hand it over to you, Katie and Christina. And uh, just to say, we'll do questions uh, as they come up, if they're relevant, but um, at the end, if they're not just like right on a point we're discussing at the time. Okay, thank you. Great. Hi, everybody. I'm just going to get my PowerPoint up and running here. Um, so um, thanks, Lois, for getting us going. Um, and I just, um, you know, would like to acknowledge and um, echo uh, Lois's um, acknowledgement of the, the um, territories that we're on. And Christina and I are both uh, coming to you from, um, as Lois said, the unceded ancestral and traditional territories of the Coast Salish people, including the Musqueam, Squamish, Squamish and Tsleil-Waututh. Um, and I just think, I just want to take a, a moment to recognize um, the importance of, of um, acknowledging the territory that we're on and the history of the land that we live and work on, um, particularly when we're talking about um, child welfare policies. Um, and I'd like to acknowledge the ongoing harms against um, Indigenous families and communities that uh, continue to be caused by state apprehension um, of Indigenous children. I know that for both Christina and I, a driving uh, motivation in the work that we do um, in advocating for increased access to kinship care placements um, is to support um, the work being done by Indigenous folks across the province to reaffirm sovereignty over Indigenous child welfare. Um, so we've got this agenda for today. Um, we don't have that many slides and what we're actually hoping to do is spend uh, a good amount of time today um, just having discussion and, and hearing from you folks about um, what's happening in your work. Um, but we'll, we'll go through the slides um, first. Feel free to send questions like Lois said into the chat um, in the meantime if stuff comes up that's sort of pertinent to, to the slide that we're talking about. Um, so first, uh, Christina is just going to talk a bit about Parent Support Services Society of BC um, and the Grandparents Raising Grandchildren Support Line. Then we'll talk about um, what kinship care is and who a kinship caregiver is and um, move from there into the different kinds of kinship care arrangements that we see in BC. Um, and then we'll talk about um, the benefits, services and supports that are available um, under those different kinds of arrangements. So I will pass it on to Christina then. Good afternoon. So I'm Christina Campbell. I'm the advocate social worker that answers the grandparents raising grandchild, grandchildren support line at Parent Support Services Society of BC. And uh, Parent Support Services Society's mission is to protect the safety and well-being of children and to promote the health of families by providing support, education, advocacy, and research and resources to those in a parenting role. And I'm one of two advocates that answer the support line, and I've been answering the support line. It'll be nine years <laughs> in uh, coming up to nine years in February. So, and I think one of the things that I love best about my job is that I'm still talking to some of those same families. So one of the key things that we do on the line is we accompany families over time. And Katie's gonna introduce herself now. Yeah, hi um, everyone. Like I said, I'm Katie Gerke and um, I'm a sole practitioner um, focusing mainly on family um, child protection and indigenous legal issues um, and do a bit of a mixed practice um, there and um, I was the advocate lawyer um, with Parent Support Services um, for about 18 months um, from January 2019 until October 2020. Yeah, so just a little little bit more about the services that we provide and what you may want to know about us is we operate the support line on Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, and Friday from 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. Um, with COVID happening, that service is um, sometimes direct service. I'm trying to get to the office on Tuesdays and Thursdays, but I'm picking up my voicemail regularly when I'm working from home. So we're prime, trying to provide the same continuity of service, even though um, we're not always able to come into the office because of COVID. 
So I pick up the phone and speak to anybody who calls me and I do serve um, advocates. I was working with a um, poverty advocate yesterday who is engaging directly with a kinship care client and happy to do that direct service to you. So when you come across families that are in a kinship care role, you're, you're welcome to call me on the support line. Um, it is a kinship care support line. So we support anybody in a kinship care role. So we talk to the aunties and uncles and cousins and siblings that are parenting when parents can't parent. And it is it is a job share. Um, Katie and I were working together and now I'm, I'm doing the job of two. Um, there's a posting on Charity Village if you're interested. We're looking for an advocate, someone to fill the advocate lawyer role. And that's because we just find that... Um, even though we are unable to provide legal advice on the line, that having that social work um, and legal expertise really meets what we're able to um, speak to in terms of our expert expertise. And that's where kinship care and, and ministry policy and family law intersect. Um, and we on the line traditionally provide a cross disciplinary collaborative approach. And um, yeah. Thanks, Christina. So um, who is a kinship caregiver? A kinship caregiver is somebody with a family or cultural connection or strong relationship with a child in need who cares for that child on a full-time basis, um, either temporarily or permanently. Um, and it's important to just note, and um, uh, you know, where I think this is a fortunate thing that, that we want to try to push for more and more in the work that we do is that both law and policy um, prioritize kinship care placements. So um, family placements um, are prioritized in the Child Family Community Service Act, um, as well as um, through MCFD policy. Um, and um, even within MCFD policy, the definition of who an extended family member or who a kinship caregiver is, um, is fairly broad. And so um, it sort of echoes that definition that we've thrown up there, which is, um, you know, the important thing is that it's a person who has a strong connection or relationship with a child. So how do children come into kinship care? Um, there are um, different pathways and um, and even within each pathway, um, every situation is, is unique, uh, as many of you may know from your work. Um, the vast majority of uh, kinship care children in BC are living in informal kinship care arrangements. Um, and so what we mean by informal is that um, there, there hasn't been any involvement um, from the Ministry for Children and Family Development, um, and um, there are no court orders um, confirming the placement. And so um, those families often find themselves in, in really challenging or precarious positions because they don't have um, legal authority over the children that they're caring for. Um, and so um, that can create some barriers around accessing healthcare, um, enrollment in school, uh, getting passports, all of those kinds of things. Um, under uh, so some some of the other ways that um, children are in kinship care, um, I, it's so many children um, will be with you know grandparents, aunties, uncles um, who have family law have gone out and gotten guardianship under the Family Law Act, um, and so that's um, standard guardianship the same way that a that a parent is a guardian of a child, um, but in that case, guardianship is granted to a kinship caregiver. Um, we're going to talk more about um, the different options under the Child Family Community Service Act um, that, that children can be in kinship care placements. Um, and then, of course, there's adoption. Um, and, you know, oftentimes there can be a, a mix of these pathways as well. So, um, you know, a, a child who may have been originally placed in kinship care under the Child Family Community Service Act may eventually be adopted by that family member um, through the Adoption Act. Um, but the important thing about um, uh, these different pathways and what we kind of wanted to represent in, in um, with the visual there is um, that what legal pathway a family follows can have a significant impact on the availability of services and supports for them. And oftentimes, once you're on a certain pathway, there's um, 
you know, either no way to turn back or, or it's very challenging to do so. Um, and so what we really want to do as um, advocates for kinship care families um, is um, provide them with fulsome information right at the beginning before they, um, they start walking down one of these pathways. And that way we can ensure that families are provided with the most support um, that is, that's available to them. So um, if we're going to, what I want to do now is sort of look at where are the supports for those in a families that are doing kinship care. And so one of the, it's a support agreement that's available through the Ministry for Children and Family Development or a delegated Aboriginal agency is the Extended Family Program Agreement. It actually comes under Section 8 of the Child Family Community Service Act, but it's an arrangement that um, provides support to the caregiver when parents are unable to parent. Um, there's been recent policy changes that came into effect in April 1st, 2019 that are, are really important to recognize. Um, so what used to be a three-way agreement between a parent, a social worker, and a caregiver can now be a two-way agreement between um, a caregiver and a social worker. And so there's an opportunity, there's policy has changed in a way to create space for, for more families to find themselves eligible if parents don't have capacity to participate in the, in the support agreement. Um, and so, and it's also some of the richest supports that are available to families. So in order to be eligible for this program, the social worker has to assess the, the parents as being temporarily able, unable to provide care for their child. Um, there's a screening process for the caregiver. Um, and then the services and support courts can go to that family member while they're in arrangement with the child. Under these arrangements, parents retain their full legal authority of the children. And so if they're not party to the agreement, because they can be party to the agreement, but they can also choose not to be party to the agreement, but they do have to sign they have to have the capacity to sign Schedule A one time. And the Schedule A is the transfer of the parental responsibilities as they are under the Family Law Act to the caregiver. So you need parent consent to have an extended family program, but parents no longer have to be party to the program. And it also creates space for nations to be party to um, an extended family program as well. So again, those arrangements can be as it can be a social worker and a caregiver, uh, a caregiver um, in an agreement, or it can be a social worker, a parent, and a caregiver, or it can be a social worker, a parent, a caregiver, and representation from the nation, or just a social worker, a representation from the nation, and a caregiver. Um, so it's really broadened recently. And so what else is new in the policies that are attached to the extended family program agreement is there's new space for supports, extended family program supports that are available under extended family program to support a customary care arrangement over time. And so customary care is not defined in the policy or the legislation, but it creates space for an Indigenous families to acknowledge the relationship as a customary care arrangement. And if the social worker assesses that the parent doesn't have capacity to parent, then that family can receive that assistance through that support agreement. And they can receive it over time. Extended family program was a temporary program and the time limits have been removed from the policy. So it's now possible for children to age over care, age out of care under extended family program agreements, which is really important because they're the richest supports available to families. Um, if it's determined that it's in the child's best interest to do so. I don't know, Katie, did you want to add something under that? No. 
And so this just is a slide that I think is useful just in talking about um, what are what are the parental responsibilities that are transferred over to that caregiver and the extended family policy, the program, the policy for the extended family program policy lists a minimum four minimum responsibilities that must be transferred, but there's actually again space for parents to retain some parental responsibilities. And so it's now possible for for that to happen and so that's really interesting that we're creating space for parents to potentially parent to the capacity because we have a child welfare system that's basically all or nothing and we're finding a shift in policy we're creating room for um, parents to parent to capacity and for supports to still flow to families great okay so um uh, that's the extended family program, um, and um, uh, as sort of what ends up being in practical reality sort of similar to the outcomes of the extended family program agreements, where you have um, a temporary transfer of, of custody with parental extent, um, consent. Um, there are also um, interim and temporary custody to other orders um, that are, are often used as well in kinship care situations. Um, so those are under, there's a couple different sections of the Child Family Community Service Act where you find those and I've listed them there on the slide. Um, and so, you know, essentially what these orders do is um, it's an interim order placing um, a child in the custody of a person other than the parent with the consent of the parent um, and under the director's supervision. Um, the re like, you know, like I said at the beginning, I mean, the, the reality ends up being fairly similar to what's happening under extended family program agreement. There's less supports available and we'll chat about that near to the end of the presentation. Um, but, um, you know, in terms of why um, an, an interim or temporary custody to other order would be um, uh, used instead of an extended family program agreement, I think, um, you know, what I can say in, in my experience is that oftentimes it really comes down to um, what social worker practice at that office is. Um, and so, um, you know, I, I've seen, um, you know, I've I had situations advocating for families where, um, you know, we had asked for an EFP and, and you know, we're told that, no, they were going to do the interim and temporary custody to other order. That was that practice at that office. And, um, and you know, I'm not sure really what the logic is behind that, but that's kind of, I mean, I think folks who have worked with, um, you know, the ministry may have um, experience with, you know, sometimes you just go with the social worker decision and, um, uh, and yeah. Um, so then another option is um, restricted foster care or restricted um, family care homes. So this is um, legally equivalent to a foster care placement, um, but what happens is the foster um, the foster parent is the kinship caregiver, and so the foster parent is known to the child and has a kinship relationship with them. Um, importantly, unlike in other kinds of foster care arrangements, um, there's no expectation on that person to care for children other than the, the kinship care child, um, and so um, uh, again, it's just a way of, um, uh, recognizing and then, um, uh, providing that legal backing for the kinship care placement. Um, and the supports and services offered, um, through restricted foster care, um, are, are similar to those that are under the interim and temporary custody to other orders. And again, we'll, we'll get into a little bit more detail about that, um, near the end. Um, and so all of the programs, um, that we've mentioned are generally considered to be temporary programs. I mean, the interim and temporary custody to other is a, a temporary program. The EFP used to be, and now there's space for it not to be. Um, and so this is the, so permanent kinship care under section 54.01 or 0.1 of the Child Family Community Service Act is um, the, the permanency um, option. And so what we generally find is that families will move from an EFP or an interim or, te to, uh, interim or temporary custody to other order um, into a permanent kinship care order. 
And so children will age out um, under these orders. The difference between a section 5401 and a 54.1 is just whether or not there's been a a continuing custody order. So um, the section 5401s would happen in in when there hasn't been a CCO. And then if there has been one, um, then then the relevant section is is 54.1. And that's really the only difference between those two. Okay, um, so this is an important one, um, and, and I think you know if if Christine and I could pick something for you guys to take away, it would you know to just really understand that um, there are very significant um, ramifications to kinship caregivers getting guardianship under the Family Law Act, and um, you know I I make a point of emphasizing that because. In my work at PSS and certainly in Christina's work, I know um, we've both noticed a, a trend where social workers are often encouraging or, or pushing families to um, go out and get guardianship under the Family Law Act. Um, and for some families, you know, that may be the best option, but for a lot of families, it's it's not. And I can explain, I'll, ex- you know, kind of explain why. And so, um, guardianship under the Family Law Act, um, it's under um, Section 51.1, um, where a court can either appoint or terminate a person's guardianship. A court um, will only terminate guardianship as a last resort and only in circumstances where there's no other way to protect a child's best interest. So generally, when a kinship caregiver, let's say a grandma, gets, goes out to get a guardianship order, she doesn't become the guardian in place of the parents. She becomes a guardian in addition to a parent. So um, what you end up with is a situation that's not dissimilar from separated parents who are co-parenting and will have a, a you know parenting orders through family court. Um, but it'll be grandma co-parenting with um, uh, with you know um, both or one parent depending on who has guardianship. Um, and Again, for some families, that's going to be a really great option, and and it can be a really powerful thing not to have um, parental rights disrupted. Um, But for other families, what this ends up meaning is um, ongoing family law litigation. And so, um, you know, parents are entitled um, to, um, you know, make uh, applications in family court um, for parenting time, um, for a change in parenting arrangements. Um, and, and oftentimes that leaves kinship caregivers in the situation where they're, you know, needing to hire lawyers um, and to, to deal with the litigation. Um, and then there are some other significant consequences, like um, if a kinship caregiver is caring for a child under an FLA guardianship order, and the child eventually goes back to live with a parent, that actually creates child support obligations on that kinship caregiver, the same as um, you know, child support obligations that are are um, that exist for for, like I said, parents who are who have separated and are co-parenting with with family law act orders. Um another um uh implication of a guardianship order is um, that there's no special category of kinship caregiver under the FLA. And so there's no recognition of um, of grandma's role as a kinship caregiver. She becomes a parent um, or guardian the same as any other parent or guardian in BC, which means there's no um, uh, financial support that is available to other kinship caregivers. Um, that grandma then becomes ineligible for those supports. And so in particular, then there's, there's no... Um, uh, there, uh, she would be ineligible to receive any financial support through the Ministry for Children and Family Development or a, or a delegated Aboriginal agency. Um, what I, I will say is where I have found that families have wanted guardianship orders and that has been the right choice for a family um, is families where um, continuing to engage with MCFD is just not a safe or or um, or good option for that family. And certainly for a lot of Indigenous families in particular, um, you know, dealing with the ministry, um, you know, can, is wrapped up in, you know, ongoing impacts of colonization. Um, and, and, and that is, you know, we, we respect and honour those decisions when families make them. Um, 
the most important thing we can do um, for kinship caregivers is just make sure that they have all of this information at the outset. And what we find is that often when social workers encourage kinship caregivers to go out and get guardianship um, orders, um, that kinship caregiver doesn't understand um, the, the full um, the, the full consequences of, of what that order is going to do. And there's no going back. Once you have a guardianship order under the Family Law Act, um, you know, that's, um, that's final. There's no going back and then working with MCFT to get an order under the CFCSA. Okay, I'll pass it back to Christina. Yeah, so this is like um, a big table. <laughs> of what, what's available to families. And the ministry, so on the left-hand side of the table, you have the programs and arrangements that are available to families under the Child Family Community Service Act. And then you have a table of the supports that families can access. So I'll just go through it with you quickly so that you have a sense of what's available to families. And so at the top is the Extended Family Program Agreement. Um, all the maintenance rates tend to be the same except the post-adoption assistance, which is income and asset tested. But when you're in an extended family program agreement, if the children do not have um, medical coverage, MSP, basic medical from parents, or if there's extenuating health needs, then you do um, get Blue Cross coverage through the Ministry for Children and Family Development. So children are covered for their basic medical, their extended medical, and their dental care and optical. Um, they also um, can access the child care um, subsidy and surcharge. And what the surcharge is, is that child care subsidy is, is income tested in BC. So there's a child care subsidy or a child affordable benefit, um, child care benefit for, that for any parent in BC, but it's income tested. And when you have um, an agreement or order under the CFCSA, it's not income tested. And the surcharge allows the ministry to basically double the amount of uh, uh, subsidy that's available to families due to the arrangement. So it's quite fulsome childcare that's available under the EFP. And importantly, when you're in these kinds of supported agreements, you can still access the federal benefits that are available for children. And there's two benefits. There's the Canada Child Benefit. And then for children who, has, who have disabilities, there's the disability um, benefit. And for children who are in out of care arrangements for a minimum of two years, and it doesn't have to be um, consecutive, then you're also eligible for the tuition waiver, which is accessed when you attend a post-secondary institution or identified trade, financial aid institution um, that you're attending. Um, and if you have meet the eligibility criteria, which is the two years in an out of care arrangement, then, then the ministry um, or government pays your tuition and your school fees for you for your first degree. Um, so it is the extended family program is the most fulsome program available to families. And I guess the other thing that I want to highlight as advocates is sometimes um, social workers you're meeting families where kids are in, in kinship care because of safety agreements. The safety plan has been put in place. And what we find in practice is that social workers aren't necessarily talking about the services and supports to families. So if you're not aware of it and you're not asking for it, then you don't get it. So a safety plan is when a social worker makes an agreement with the social worker and a caregiver to, that the child lives somewhere else. Um, and it's, they're meant to be very short in duration and they're meant to provide an opportunity for a social worker to assess the child's needs. There's no supports for caregivers under those kinds of arrangements and there's no supports for the parents to change the situation of why the safety plan is needed in the first place. So, um, at, so if you're coming into contact with parents who are, um, have safety plans in place, it's really important that either the parent or the caregiver 
knows that they can request an extended family program agreement. Um, there's an obligation for the social worker to serve the parent under those support agreements. Um, whether it doesn't matter if whether the parent is party to that agreement or whether they've signed Schedule A, and that's because the so the goal of the social policy is family reunification. Therefore, services need to be provided to the parent. Now, whether the parent accepts those services or participates is irrelevant to the service delivery to the caregiver and the children. But for some families who are who are really needing support and are ready to address what's undermining them to parent. Um, um, their kids or has brought them under the microscope of the Ministry for Children and Family, and then there is services for them under this extended family program. Um, the services under the other orders are really clear, so it's all on the table. I think the piece that I want to make clear to caregivers is that other than the extended family program agreement, okay, and with the exception of the post-adoption assistance. And as you can see under the Family Law Act, if you're in an out of care arrangement and you're receiving maintenance payments to provide for those children, you're not eligible for the federal benefits. And that's because there's a piece of federal legislation called the Children's Special Allowance Act um, that transfers that money from the federal government to the provincial government. And those federal dollars are rolled into the provincial maintenance benefits that you're getting. So rather than getting them on top of your provincial maintenance payments, they're included. And Parent Support Services Society is doing some advocacy around some systemic changes, specifically with children who have disability. <laughs> Um, because you know, what the federal government acknowledges in terms of the extra costs for kids with disability is not acknowledged um, when those dollars are rolled in and everybody gets the same amount um, through, through maintenance payments. Um, but just to make you aware of that, um, and the Federal Income Tax Act also um, says that if you are collecting provincial maintenance payments, you cannot claim those children as dependents for tax purposes. And that's because the children are not wholly dependent on you. You're giving, you're getting maintenance payments. And it's really important for families to recognize this. When um, caregivers have children come into the care, it's social workers are obligated to let them know this information. Um, but we're, 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 you know, we are meeting families where that information isn't communicated and aware, or there's a lack of administration, administrative fairness around this piece, and, and families are getting themselves um, into trouble in terms of just into debt, you know, having grandparents go, you know, we've, well, there's lots of stories. Anyways, it's really important that families recognize what they're entitled to and what they can collect. Um, and with the post-adoption assistance, the other piece that's important to know that if kids have a disability, then you there's also services and support. There's additional services attached to the post-adoption assistance. So even though it's income and asset tested um, for low-income families where children are um, disabled, it, there's it can be more fulsome because you can access those federal dollars and you can access additional support services for the child um, through that, even though the maintenance rates are lower. So, in the next slide, this is, a, this is a document that the Ministry for Children and Family Development has created um, so that social workers can engage with their families <laughs> and provide them with the fulsome information. And we just wanted you to know that we've included it. So there is a document um, that the government has created that looks at um, the options and talks about the difference between the options um, in the category that's also on the left. So it goes through what the criminal record check under each of those looks like. 
um, you know, court orders, the social worker involvement, the guardianships. So it's a six, I think it's a six page document that we've um, made available to you. So that's a tool that you have. Um, and, and again, um, I'm there to support you on the support line and answer your questions. So we're going to have a dialogue now, but if there's particular casework that you want to consult in, you know, I'm also available to make appointments and speak to you and your client together. I mean, it's really important if you're engaging with families in your community face to face and you have that relationship that you have more than a capacity to refer to a stranger on a support line that I can support you in that relationship or we can talk together so that so that that family feels that they're getting the information that they need. So happy to work with you and your families in whatever capacity um, makes sense for you in, in your personal practice. So. Yeah, so um, yeah, so I have made this document available on the sketch just so everybody knows it's been uploaded um, so you can find it there and I've also put our PowerPoint up. Um, and yeah, so at this point, this is, um, like Christina said, um, she's, uh, honestly calling her, um, is the best thing you could do. Like she, her brain, um, she's such an expert on this stuff and, um, uh, you know, it's just, um, yeah, I don't think there's, there's anyone else with the same expertise on kinship care doing this work. So I really encourage folks to reach out to her, but of course, um, we're here now to have a discussion as well, if anyone has any questions. Yeah, so basically, if anybody has a question, then you can just ask it if you want. I think you get, you can put up, I don't know if you can put up your hand first. If you have questions... You could come up and ask them. If you don't have sound or video, then you can put things in the chat. Is it possible for a grandparent to apply for guardianship post-CCO? How likely are they to be successful if MCSD has decided they are not a good person to place with? Um, that's a great question, and I will start answering it um, as hopefully Christina comes back on and she can speak to it as well. Um, you can, like a grandparent, um, anybody can apply for guardianship essentially at any time. Um, and that decision is always made um, based on the, the best interest of the child. So... Um, how likely are they to be successful? Um, it, um, you know, it, it really, I think, depends on the facts. Um, and if there's, you know, if MCFD um, doesn't support the placement, uh, it may depend on the, the reason MCFD doesn't support the placement. Um, it, it may also depend on certain things like does that um, grandparent have access to legal representation when they make that um, when they make that application, um, you know, because that can help make a, a sort of more um, fulsome application. Um, Christina, I'm just speaking a little bit to question in the chat. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah. I can um, see the chat. Thanks, Katie. Great. Um, so uh, essentially what I've said, and maybe I'll pass it on to you, is yes, a grandparent can apply post-CCO. And in terms of how likely they are to be successful, it's, it's probably pretty fact-specific. Yeah, I think to just add to that, they would they would do that under through the family law act. So the sole determination that a judge would make would be the best interest of the child. And and so it would depend on how long after as well. What I I do know is when there is a, a, a CFC, CFCSA order in place, OK, that any further legal action triggers, the system is triggered in that the ministry is notified through the centralized branch that there's been an application to change one of government's orders. And what happens is that that then gets, goes from the centralized services branch to the local ministry office. And that social worker has, um, oh, am I going off track? I'm reading the question again. No, you're not going off track. Yeah, <laughs> right. So, so what I, I guess I, I'm not sure.
if I'm answering this question right, but what I find interesting then, just so that we know how the system works, is that it, it and it, you know, once the CCO is ordered and then the child, like usually, is it possible for a grandparent to apply for a guardianship post CCO? So that means the child, like, like who's like I guess my question I'm reading it that the child is you know has been are you saying the child's been returned to parent care then they were successful at the CCO or they're in another family cares member maybe I they're guess. in foster care she says mm. okay so they're okay so the permanency plan after the CCO is foster care okay um which is not a permanency plan government wouldn't right. see that as permanency plan so would so that lends itself so it's important to recognize the law um really um prioritizes family placement right so being so it would it would it would it would have bearing on on what that relationship or the significance of that grandparent to that to that child, right? Um, and what were the circumstances of why they weren't considered a placement or pre CCO, right? But what I'll, I'll just finish my thought because I think it's important to understand that if there's a, a CFCSA order standing and then there's a, an application to change that under the FLA, that it does trigger um, through the ministry system first and through the justice system, first the ministry is notified um, from, the, th from the courts to their centralized services office and then it goes back to the local social work office and then there they can open the file they can and they can look at the history right um, they can't engage with anybody but they can look at and decide whether they want to apply for intervener status so if they have reason why they didn't put the care in this grandparents care um, because grandparent puts the child at risk, um, they can't engage with that um, grandparent. They have no grounds to engage with that grandparent, but they can go look at that file and it's that social worker um, based on the file, only looking at the file gets to determine whether the ministry wants to apply for intervener status or not. Um, and if they don't intervene. The judge also has an opportunity at court to, you know, say time has passed, right? The ministry didn't want the child going to this, to this um, grandparent, but time has passed and maybe it's relevant, right? To consideration or whatever, then he can refer it to the family, to a family justice counselor. And then that just family justice counselor does a report, okay, engages with the grandparent and does a report that submits it to the court. So the judge has current relevant information around the best interest to the child of whether that he, he can place with that. So um, I hope that's been, I hope that's clear. Um, um, it's hard once CCOs are in place. Um, there's advocacy that you can do if you're family because of the because of the placement priority with family. So it's really very case specific, and creating that argument um, around family placement priorities. Foster care is never considered a permanency plan for kids. So if they're in foster care post CCO, they would be on the adoption um, registry, right? Um, and so there's always, always space for more litigation. <laughs> Lois, I think you're, if you're trying to say, I can see your mouth moving, but <laughs> we're not hearing you. Sorry, there we go. I was just drawing attention to the fact there's another question on chat. A person who says there's an isolated parent with no family connection and uses respite care with a foster parent and MC MCFD found reasons not to return the child, place the foster parent under the EFP. So they're wondering whether this is, I guess, about the EFP, whether it's legal to give the foster parent the EFP. Was the question. Yeah, so I mean, 
Yes, in the sense that EFPs, if there's an established significant relationship, um, then you can make an arrangement, right? So how long was that child doing respite care with the foster parent? So there, I mean, there's an established significant relationship. So that would give grounds for the agreement. It's important to recognize that you can't have an EF P agreement without a parent agreeing to it. Okay, so even if they're not party to the proceedings, right, um, that parent has to sign Schedule A or there's no EFP. So just again, curious, I'm going to read the question again. Um, an isolated parent that has no family connection and uses respite with a foster parent and they found reasons not to return the child and place the foster parent under the EFP. So when you have an EFP, so you're engaging with the parent and this parent doesn't have family support, so it's getting formal support. So the ministry doesn't have grounds to do, or, or, the, the law requires them to use the least intrusive measures. So if they can do an EFP instead of a removal, they're going to want to do that. So this parent, they've assessed this parent is struggling in their capacity to, to parent this child. You can use an extended family program as a safety mechanism, but parents have full legal rights. The problem is, is when they assert them, <laughs> then they can trigger more intrusive, right? So what is the capacity issue? Like why, it, it, are there safety concerns? Are there no safety concerns? Because that would determine on how much a parent can assert themselves. I would say if there's safety concerns, there's not much. You know, social workers are gonna use their big stick and say, parent, you either sign this EFP agreement or, you know, we're gonna do a removal. So. A parent has to recognize under an EFP agreement, they don't want to sign Schedule A, right? They want to be present. They want to parent their child, right? So it's an opportunity for them to be party to an agreement and try and hold on to as many parenting responsibilities as they can. So, and they, like I said, the policy stipulates there's a minimum of four parenting responsibilities don't have the policy open, so I can't tell you what those are right now. So they don't have to hand over all their parental responsibilities. So it's about negotiating with the social worker. How can they still parent? What parenting pieces can they do? Okay, well, they're addressing some of the issues that the social worker has around their capacity um, to parent. So um so it's it's great that the child, you know, but they can't they can't do the EFP without the parents' agreement. So, but you don't want to, I guess the the you just have to be careful that you're not pushing that social worker to do something more intrusive like a removal. So where's the middle ground, right? But that's kind of if that makes sense. She says it does. Okay, perfect. <laughs> Good. Um, I, and I just want to say, just, I mean, this wasn't the most important part of the question, but I, I do just want to say, I think on the question around the, like the double dipping, um, it, th that wouldn't be possible is it, there would either be a respite or foster parent agreement and the foster caregiver would get support under that agreement, or there's an EFP agreement and that's where the support's coming from. You wouldn't have both. Um, and so, no, Christina, you're not, you're no. not agreeing with me. Oh, okay. I got something to add. Keep going. Oh, <laughs> no, that, I just wanted to clarify that. So you wouldn't, so someone wouldn't double yeah. dip. Yeah. But it does bring up what are the other supports for parents who are struggling? And so there's the section five agreements, which I would never reckon, like I always tell families about, but I always like, this is something that puts you under the microscope of MCFD. So I'm always mindful of the vulnerability of families when they're in, engaged with ministry social workers, but this is a family that's already engaged. So let's look at what is available for this parent under a section five agreement. So you can Google the CFCSA, it's clear, but it's also why, because it gives you A, B, C, D, and E. There's services for the children, mostly, right? The great thing about an EFP is there's services for the parents, right? So th they're different, 
but you can get a six month agreement that is renewable under section five. And again, it's not something, it's, it, it's, it's, it's it can be a resource for parents who are already under the lens. You don't want to go off and tell parents about support agreements under Section 5, you know, without being mindful if ministry is not already engaged, they're going to be engaged. And often it can lead to more intrusive measures. So be mindful of that. But there's things like home support listed in the law, right? So there's there are tools there. And again, a social worker isn't necessarily going to tell a parent about these services. And so it's really important for parents to know what they can ask for. So I find that when families go to government and say, oh, I need help, right? Like if they don't say what they need, then help is not provided. And so it's a really important role, especially as family law advocates, that you're aware of what help there is and, and help families to name what might be useful. Um, so, and again, the difference between doing a section five agreement or doing a section eight, which is um, the extended family program is that one would provide the parent with services, right? Um, and the other would provide the child with services. Um, I, I hope that's helpful. I really imagined when we were doing this is that I would hear your beautiful voices. <laughs> I feel silly talking to my computer, but anyways, let's, any other questions? <laughs> I have, I was wondering, can you hear me? Yeah. Oh, cool. Um, so does this whole program apply when you're, when client, when advocates are working with indigenous childcare service agencies? Like, and, you know, the authorities, other authorities? Or is it just an MCFD thing? No, well, the delegated Aboriginal agencies follow right. the same policy and law. So these services are available for all families in British Columbia. It, it, if you're living on reserve, it depends on how you're, like, that gets a little bit different because some nations... Um, do have agreements and are getting child welfare services through MCFD, then of course, even if you're on reserve, you would, that's where your child welfare services are coming from. So, but it's, that's not applicable to all nations because they have different arrangements, right? Um, so these are, what we're talking about today is what's available through child welfare in BC through the, through the government, whether it's um, MCFD, MCFD Aboriginal Services, or Delegated Aboriginal Agency. And I had another question. Mm -hmm. Do these, do the, any of these benefits have an impact on, or are they different if someone's on welfare, if they're on income assistance? These, 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 none of these benefits are what the ministry calls maintenance payments that the supports these families receive under these arrangements, they're not income and asset tested. You're not, uh, you don't have to declare them on your taxes. So, um, and so it doesn't, I'm, you know, I'm not, I'm not well versed Lois on, 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 on welfare and poverty in terms of what you have to claim as income. But I do know for tax purposes that you don't claim it as taxes because it's money for the children. So I don't know if you actually have to, I don't, I doubt it, um, but maybe there's somebody else, maybe there's a poverty advocate in the group here who can answer that, but um, um, it shouldn't impact your welfare at all. Or maybe Katie can answer it. Well, um, I mean, not, um, uh, the not exactly <laughs> well but I was, I was just going to add that mm -hmm. I um that we I the, it is provided for under um uh policy around the extended family program agreement um that if the parent is on um income assistance and the and the child goes into kinship care 
um, the parent doesn't lose the ability to claim the child under mm. their welfare. Um, so that's an important piece because mm -hmm. um, it, so if you have a parent on income assistance, you know, you can, the FP is great because not only does that parent retain their legal rights, um, but it doesn't necessarily disrupt um, their access to social assistance as well. And, and, and the purpose behind that, of, of course, is if you take those, that support away from parents, you're making it even less likely that they're going to be able to have the child return to their care. Um, so that is in the policy. Um, and then we, we just had a comment. It would also be exempted income if the caregiver was in receipt of income assistance or PWD. Oh, that's great. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. So, um, yeah. That, that was my assumption. Yes. But, yeah. Thanks for clarifying. <laughs> okay. Well, we may be yeah. at an end. Yeah. Sure. Okay. Um, okay, guys. You're all shy. You're still not going to put on your cameras. <laughs> like I have looked at my face for two hours every second afternoon for two months. You guys should open your cameras. But anyway, thank you, everybody. Thank you, Katie and Christina. Um, You're welcome, Lois. And everybody can follow up. Uh, contact information is there. And I guess we'll pass your job description around too in case people are. Yeah. Anybody want to work with me? <laughs> it's a fantastic position. I, I learned so much. It's yeah. Very, very incredible opportunity. It was hard to leave. Yeah. No, it's good work. Well, thank you very much. We'll uh, say goodbye to everyone then. Bye. Bye-bye.